Welcome to the latest edition of Science or Nonsense, The Dangers of High Protein Diets. This is in regards to an article in a very popular health website called Very Well Health. The article is titled, Six Signs You're Eating More uh, Protein Than You Need. Now, I did not include the author's name here because this is nothing personal. I don't know the author. It's just about the content of the article. Of course, you could look it up, but that's not what this is all about. Here's what you can expect to learn in this video. First, we'll give a definition of what is a high protein diet because the article gives no definition. So you learn what it is in this video. Then we're, we're going to bust five myths that the article well spreads. <laughs> Before we jump in, who am I? My name is Igor. I'm the author of 13 books on exercise and nutrition, including four Amazon best sellers. As well, I've been a personal trainer since 2006, and I've been training personal trainers in my methodology since 2013 by speaking at other personal training conferences um, and mentoring uh, lots of trainers one-on-one. -on -one. As well, I've done over 400 presentations to some of Canada's largest corporations, including the Royal Bank of Canada, Investors Group, American Express, IBM, and others. So first, let's jump in. The first problem with the article is that there is no definition of what is a high-protein diet. The author just states that a high-protein diet causes all these problems while stating what is a high-protein diet. So what is it? Well, according to both Health Canada and the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, they recommend a protein intake of between 10 and 35% of your total calories. So by definition, anything over 35% makes a high protein diet. Now that we have that definition out of the way, let's talk about the nonsense points that the author brings up. Nonsense point number one is that a high protein diet gives you keto breath. Here's the author's claim. Ketosis is associated with a high protein diet, including the keto diet. Now here is mistake number one. I didn't think by the way it was possible to make two mistakes Two false claims in one sentence, but this author did it successful. Here's mistake number one. She equates a low protein, uh, low carb diet with a high protein diet, but they are not necessarily both uh, inevitable. You can have low protein and low carb. Uh, you don't have to have low protein and high and, and high carb or low carb and high protein. So here's what a typical low carb diet looks like. A low carb diet normally is about 20% carbs, maybe about 20 to 35% protein, and the remainder is fat. A keto diet is a different type of low-carb diet in the sense that it's low-carb and low-protein. On a typical keto diet, carbs make up less than 50 grams or less than 5% of total calories. Protein, by necessity, protein has to be low on a keto diet because high protein can kick you out of ketosis, so it has to be low. And the remainder of the keto diet is fat, dietary fat, lipids. So that's mistake number one. Is she equates low carbs with high protein. They don't, they're not one of the same thing. Mistake number two is that she says that keto breath comes from high protein. Well, that's not true. Keto breath comes from low carbs, not high protein. Their, their high protein is just incidental. You can have high protein, you can have low protein, you'll get, you'll, get, you'll get keto breath regardless if the carbs are low. Nonsense point number two that the author makes is that a high protein diet leads to fat gain. Why? How does she justify this claim? Well, she says that more protein usually means more calories in the protein source. You choose maybe packed with saturated fat. Okay, why set up a straw man argument? Why assume that all sources of protein are all sources um, of saturated fat or high fat? Some are, but many, many aren't. Um, now, yeah, things like ground beef, lean ground beef, stuff like that, e e even there, uh, high in protein and high in fat, true. Uh, salmon, for example, is high protein and high fat. True, but there are plenty of sources that are high in protein and low in fat. For example, things like turkey, uh, lean lean chicken or lean chicken breast, tuna, cod or tilapia, shrimps. These are, these are all examples of foods that are high in protein but low in carbs. Again, low carbs do not equate high protein. She seems to have this idea that she repeats over and over and over in this article that is just not inevitable. It's not necessarily correct. Nonsense point number three is that a high protein diet leads to GI discomfort. GI stands for gastrointestinal or digestive. Here's her claim. A, a diet high in protein, especially animal protein and low in fiber can lead to constipation, nausea, diarrhea, and stomach pain. Now, why does she tack on and low in fiber to that sentence? <laughs> the only reason she tacks on low in fiber is to make that sentence at least partially correct. It's not the high protein that leads to GI discomfort, it's the low fiber. 
you can have a high protein and high fiber diet. You can have a high protein and low fiber diet. The two are not related to each other whatsoever. You can have, so I'm not sure why she uses high protein here to say that that might lead to GI discomfort. She can leave the high protein part out of that sentence and it'll be correct. A diet low in fiber will lead to GI discomfort. That is correct. The high protein does not need to be in there at all. Doesn't make it correct. Um, the next nonsense point she brings up is that a diet, a high protein diet leads to heart disease. Here's what she states. Plant-based protein can benefit your heart health while animal-based protein can increase your risk of heart disease. Now, research shows associations between animal protein and heart disease. However, correlation is not causation. Association is not causation. For example, um, sorry, uh, for example, um, ice cream sales are associated with drowning. Does that mean that ice cream sales cause drowning? No, that's not the case because there is a third variable, which is temperature. When temperature goes up, so does swimming. When swimming goes up, so does drowning. When temperature goes up, so it is ice cream. Therefore, ice cream is correlated to drowning, but ice cream doesn't cause drowning. Same thing here. A high-protein diet is associated with heart disease, but that doesn't mean that a high-protein diet causes heart disease. There is a, There are other variables involved. Nonsense point number five is that a high-protein diet causes kidney problems. Here is what the author states. If you have kidney or liver disease, the process of breaking down excess protein can be too much work. Eating too much protein, if you have kidney disease, can even contribute to renal kidney failure. Now, this is all correct, but why does she put this in an article largely for people with healthy kidneys? Um, now, it's true that high protein can damage the kidneys of already damaged kidneys, but that doesn't mean that protein caused the kidney damage. It's like saying that jogging is bad for you if you have a broken leg. Well, of course, jogging is bad for you if you have a broken leg, but jogging didn't break your leg. This is the equivalent of what she's stating here. A tiny percent of the population has kidney damage and should not be on a high-protein diet. And then the majority of the population makes no difference. So does that mean that you should be on a high-protein diet? Well, no. An excess of anything is not good either. So... An excess of sugar is not good, an excess of protein is not good, an excess of fat is not good, an excess of carbs is not good. The body is kind of like Goldilocks. It doesn't like too little of anything or too much of anything. It likes a just the right amount. And so what's the right amount of protein? How much protein should you be getting? Well, there are different variables that it depends on. You can't just say all men should be getting this much and all women should be getting this much. You can't, you can't say that. There are three primary variables on which your protein requirements depend. In no particular order. One is your activity levels. Are you sedentary? Are you doing cardio only? Are you doing strength training only? Or are you doing cardio plus strength training? The next variable that makes a difference to your protein uh, requirements is your body weight. It's no surprise that larger people need more protein than, than smaller people. And lastly, your age. The older you are, the more protein you need. Generally speaking, people over 60 require between 30 to 50% more protein than people under 60. Why? because their absorption of protein is lower, so they need a higher amount. Now, if you want to know exactly how much protein do you need, I have a different video um, uh, that covers this topic exactly, which is on your screen right now and in the description below, titled Key Muscle Building Factors. There are two specific factors, and one of the things that it dives into is exactly how much protein you need.